about this individual. His name is Dr. Chika Akua. Okay, so I'm gonna read you his biography and then we're gonna get right into it. Dr. Chika Akua is an assistant professor of educational leadership at Clark Atlanta University and a leading authority on increasing the achievement of today's students, especially those in some of the most challenging schools and communities. His cultural proficiency, equity, and accountability work is known nationally for assisting school systems in improving school and community climate and culture. As a recognized master teacher and leadership strategist, Dr. Akua is one of the most sought after speakers at regional and national conferences, urban school districts, colleges and universities with a cultural relevant approach toward closing access and opportunity gap. He is known for his dynamic interactive presentations for teachers, leaders, parents, and students. Dr. Akua is a former teacher of the year who was recognized in two states, Virginia and Georgia, for teaching excellence. He was also selected as one of Ebony Magazine's 50 Leaders of Tomorrow, a distinction he is living up to today. Deeply committed to culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy and instructional materials, Dr. Akua has written and published several books in parent-teacher guides designed for today's students. Education for Transformation. The Keys to Releasing the Genius of African American Students is a book for teachers, right? And leaders that is used in a number of urban school districts for, for professional development. It is also used in a number of colleges and universities for preparation of pre-service teachers and leaders. The book, Honoring Our Ancestrals, Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success, and also also used as a number of high, at a number of higher schools, colleges, and universities for students and those who serve them. The book Parent Power, The Keys to Your Child's Academic and Social Success, has been used to equip and empower parents with tips and strategies to better assist their children. Dr. Kua has written 11 books. Let me put that out there. 11 books in all produce a series of 10 African origins historical videos and and seven, the 70 Black History and African Proverb posters, along with impactful online curricula for students and professional development for teachers, which can be found at www.tticlassroom.com. Dr. Akua earned his bachelor's degree in education from Hampton University, his master's degree in education and school counseling from Clark Atlanta University, and his doctorate from Georgia State University. Dr. Kua is frequently called upon by education, civic and social organizations to speak about educational excellence and cultural knowledge. He resides just outside of Atlanta with his wife for over 25 years and their two sons. I am humbled to have Dr. Akua on our platform. Let's welcome him into our space this morning. All right, peace and blessings, Brother Luru. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, sir. Trying to deal with this cold weather we have here. We're in a single digits here in Chicago today. How are you doing? Man, I know that's no joke in Chicago. Chicago's a different kind of cold, brother, but, yeah, but we're doing well. Holding it down it here in I appreciate it. Well, again, man, you know, we appreciate you, Dr. Chika Akua, for, you know, coming onto this space and, you know, we look to forward to having this collaborative conversation. I'm going to have some questions for you. Just, you know, we're just going to feed off the energy and just really, really dig into it. Um, and a lot of my, you know, questions or, or, you know, wonderings all come from, you know, feedback from Facebook, different social media platforms, um, and then just experiences that I hear from, from teachers, students, and parents, and my personal experiences, um, as an educator. So I just wanted to definitely, you know, give you that heads up and welcome you again to the space. I look forward to having this collaborative conversation with you. Absolutely. Let's get into it. I appreciate it. So, you know, did a lot of research, and like I told you, um, before we get in, we get it, we got into it, Doctor Akua. You know, there are speakers out there that can go out there and speak, but brother, you take it to the next level. You know, where you feel inspired. Now, I'm listening to a lot of consultants and speakers, and I'm like, wow, okay, I get it, I understand it. But when I listen to you, you teach me a lot. And one of the areas I was able to, you know. Uh, research was your focus on class womb. So if you can kind of talk a little bit about what is class womb? 
Yeah, that's a concept I actually picked up from uh, one of my elder brothers um, in education. His name is uh, Coach Alfred Powell. Uh, Coach Powell is the author of an amazing book uh, called Hip Hop Hypocrisy, When Lies Sound Like the Truth. And um, he also has a book called Coaching in the Classroom. But this concept of the classroom is the fact that um, over the course of a school year, we as teachers and leaders give birth to students. Um, there is a rebirth that takes place. So if you uh, take the 12 months that comprise a year, you take out two months for summer break, you take out a week, I'm sorry, two weeks for winter break, um, a week for spring break, and another week for various other holidays, you've got nine months left that teachers and leaders have with their students. And so we like to say that it's not a classroom, it's a class womb. And at the end of the year, you will give birth to something. Now, what's interesting about that is there's an ancient African concept called Wahimi Mesu. And the entire purpose of the education process was geared towards the Wahimi Mesu or the rebirth or the reawakening of the African mind. So in other words, you could not be said to have gone through the education process unless you had experienced this rebirth or said another way in, in a way that many people would, would uh, understand it or grasp it. You must be born again. That is the educational process and the, the cultural lineage that we come from. So when students come into our classroom, uh, I always would... Um, I always envision it as a rites of passage. As you know, in traditional African societies, it was a rites of passage. You entered in as a, as a boy or a male, and you came out of that rites of passage as a man. You entered in as a girl or a female, you came out of that rites of passage recognized as a woman. And so for me, as an educator, when a student comes into my class, I recognize that they come in at one level of consciousness and competence, and they come through the class womb and they are born into a new level of consciousness and competence. So hopefully that kind of gives some insight into that term. Absolutely, Dr. Akua. Um, so from what I'm taking, it's deeper than a pre and post assessment when we measure growth <laughs> academically, right? So uh, so academic growth um, it is important. Um, but we also have to look at some other indicators. We have to look at character. We have to look at consciousness. We have to look at competence. We have to look at commitment. So these are a lot of the tip things that people would typically consider intangibles. But these are things that we have to look at in terms of developing the whole child or the whole student. And that's not to the exclusion of raw academic achievement. We do want to see gains in reading. We do want to see gains in writing and math and, and all those sorts of things. Um, but we also recognize that we're dealing with, with whole human beings who need uh, each part of their being to be stimulated uh, and improved. I like that. And from my personal experience, I noticed that as a classroom teacher, I watched a, a lot of the growth within our students, especially our black boys, um, from the social aspect, you know, coming in kind of, you know, a little immature at times, but just watching the growth. And I like to credit mm -hmm. that with the support of the families, as well as my ability to model excellence for a lot of our black boys. What do you say about that? Yeah, I'm so glad that you said the support of the families. Uh, there's a brother named Kwame Ajia Koto. He founded a school called Nation House in Washington, D.C., and they don't give homework. They give family work. Mm. So just, just think of the, the, the nuanced difference between homework and family work, meaning you can't just do it by yourself as an individual. You have to engage your entire family. That's a whole different way of thinking and being as an educator. That's a whole different way of thinking and being as a student. In the Western world, in the United States, we are uh, socialized into a hyper individualistic way of thinking. But our culture is one that's communal, cooperative, uh, communal and cooperative, meaning that that we work together and we profit together. Um, and so we have to make sure that we're operating based on the best uh, principles and, and values relative to our culture rather than the dominant culture that tries to impose its values upon us. 
Mm, I like that. And that brings us to the next part of our conversation, um, Dr. Akua. It's the way that we're, we're perceived as African-Americans. You know, um, I think social media has one presentation of us. Uh, however, there's a hidden curricula that's missing um, that has us confused as African-Americans, especially when we talk about our boys and girls and way that they are perceived. We come from kings and queens. So it's that whole identity, being authentic um, that we're missing. Can you talk a little bit about just the authentic versus the alien identif identity? Yeah, so one of the theories that I developed is that of cultural identity theft. We, we know that uh, regular identity theft is when someone steals your personal information to gain access to your resources. So they may get your credit card information, your social security number, and now they have access to your accounts and your resources. Mm -hmm. Well, well, cultural identity theft is when someone steals your story. Mm. They steal the story of your history of accomplishments and contributions and your sacred knowledge. And so I oftentimes ask the question, how do you take the people that gave the world reading and writing and language and literature and architecture and engineering and astronomy and agriculture and mathematics and medicine and science and technology, how do you take the group of people that gave all of that to the world mm and then convince them that they come from a race of pimps, players, criminals, and thugs and thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so it, that's the alien identity, the pimp, player, criminal, thugs, and thought identity. That's an alien injected identity that is not a part of our cultural tradition. <clears throat> As a responsible educator, I always want to center my students in the best of their culture, which is their authentic cultural identity, which, by the way, Brother LaRue, has intentionally been kept from us. Mm -hmm. And there have been intentional attempts to erase that knowledge base. And, and what's really significant about that is history is group memory. Mm -hmm. Okay. If as an individual, if I lose my memory, you would say, oh, Brother Chica, you've got uh, amnesia, or you'd say, Dr. Kua, you, you, you're dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. If, if as an individual, I lose my memory, because if you lose your memory, you lose your mind. And if history is group memory, mm -hmm. what does that mean when a group of people lose their memory? You will begin to see them lose their mind, and it will be evident in their actions. It will be evident in their speech. So as conscious and committed educators then, it's then incumbent upon us to make sure um, that we share that rich culture and history with our students on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, um, one of the main things that's needed and deeply necessary anytime you're dealing with this situation, uh, the cure for cultural amnesia and cultural identity theft is constant doses of history as uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Baba Tishango and Billy Shaka often says, constant doses of history. And that can't be done if the teacher doesn't know the history because teachers can't teach what they don't know. Yeah. And a lot of these things are not in the curriculum. That's right. But that's why we understand that the teacher is the curriculum. Mm. The teacher, by their consciousness, competence, and commitment, is the curriculum you know what that sparked um there was something that occurred the other day with my son i was observing his teacher and she was breaking down black history month however she started with slavery and then she ended with dr martin luther king jr you know getting in ending racism can you talk about just a little bit the importance of teaching the correct history, especially when we talk about black history and informing our kids the right way so they can see, feel a sense of, wow, black history didn't start with slavery, you know? Right, and just real quick, how, how old is your son? He's five, he's five years old. So our story didn't start in slavery. One of the biggest uh, mistakes that's made um, relative to the teaching of our history is it's relegated to the shortest month of the year, February. Secondly, during the month of February, they start our story in slavery or civil rights, leaving out thousands of years of incredible accomplishment. 
Our story didn't start in slavery. Our story didn't start in 1619. Our story goes back literally millions of years, millions of years. And more recently, it goes back thousands and thousands of years. Okay. So for you to start my story at my lowest point does a serious injustice to me. But again, you can you can't teach what you don't know. And to say um, that, that Dr. Martin Luther King ended racism, well, as much as we love, appreciate, honor, elevate, and celebrate Dr. King, we know that racism didn't end with him. We know that when Barack Obama was elected president, that didn't usher in a, a post-racial reality for us. We, we can see, I mean, anybody that has two eyes to see, especially with the events of 2020, knows that racism is, is very much alive and well. Um, but our story is is more than just racism as well. So it's very, very important that we know about our traditional societies, civilizations, views, and values. So it's not just a litany of being able to call out Black inventors or Black entertainers or Black educators and things of that nature. It's really about understanding our views and values and standpoints on perspectives on critical issues in addition to historical realities and things of that nature. And unless and until we're centered in our traditional values, we'll continue to see a lot of the uh, behaviors, uh, anti-African, anti-human, self-destructive behaviors that we oftentimes see ourselves engaging in. I like that. And a lot of us, you know, as educators, you know, we, we have no prior knowledge or understanding mm -hmm. of the real information, real history. And that, you know, is critical, especially when we talk about teaching in a diverse climate. And mm -hmm. the way that we address Dr. Kua, um, just the approach to pedagogy and delivering instruction. You know, I was reading upon an area of that you wrote that you talked about brain based, you know, learning. And it seems that even from my observations as a former principal, I observed teachers teaching repetition or repeating facts and details. And if certain scholars are not getting the information, they must have an issue. But there's another side of the brain that we don't tap into. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, just the brain based learning. Absolutely. Uh, before I do, I know that there are some educators listening now who are interested in what we're saying. Um, and but they're saying, you know, where do, where do I get this information from? So let me give you some immediate resources. I have a free online course uh, that people can access. If you go to free intro to African origins dot com again, free intro to African origins dot com. Uh, there's a free six part um, online course that walks you through several videos explaining our history. Also want to uh, let the listeners know about my book, uh, Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success. Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success. Uh, another great resource would be Education for Transformation, The Keys to Releasing the Genius of African American Students. All of those uh, resources can be obtained at dracua.net. D-R-A-K-U-A dot net, Dr. Akua dot net. So I always like to leave people with resources for their continuing education uh, because people are interested in this information. As I've traveled around the country, people want to know. So relative to brain-based education, um, there's some very interesting things um, about our brains that a lot of people are not aware of. And as a result of not being aware of it, uh, are not able to um, reach our children because they're using the incorrect methods. Okay. So most of the um, teaching that goes on in America's schools is based on the left brain analytical procedures like logic, numbers, business, writing, language, science, chess, uh, and, and so-called objective thinking. OK, those are left brain analytical procedures. OK, the right brain is the relational side of the brain. It deals with art and music and imagination and intuition and things of that nature. And uh, sometimes those things are not seen as equally important. OK, but what scientific research has determined is that 
our children, black children, and many students of color reach the analytical by way of the relational. So it's not that we can't be analytical, but we reach the analytical by way of the relational. In other words, how does this relate to me? If you can show me how this relates to me, uh, then I can better begin to analyze it, break it down, and then synthesize it, put it back together and find out how to apply it. And so what, what, one of the questions that I ask teachers, if we're, when we're talking about left brain and right brain processes, and the fact that right brain processes are typically not utilized in the classroom, I always ask the question, do I have to lose my right mind to be successful in your class? So it's not placing the right mind above the left, uh, the right brain above the left brain or the left brain above the right brain. It's about affecting a balance. We have two hemispheres to the brain. But a lot of times when students go to school, <laughs> they're engaged in a lobotomy where half of their brain is is not being used. That's deep. That's deep. And before we got into the space, you and I, we discussed just culturally relevant teaching. And my question I always have is when you have a Eurocentric approach to education, how do you really make that culturally relevant? You know what I'm saying? How, how is that a connection? to our black and brown scholars in which we service. So um, if you can talk a little bit about that, um, Dr. Akua, because I, I enjoy your perspective and I, you know, I'm looking at the chat right now, just the right and the left side and that creativity. But if it's culturally relevant within our curricular, then we will see more scholar engagement and scholars won't be so bored in the classroom, right? So if you can talk a little bit about the importance of culturally relevant pedagogy. So culturally relevant um, pedagogy and culturally relevant curriculum should go hand in hand. It should not be one, one or the other. It should be both and. And I would say culturally relevant and culturally responsive because something could be relevant uh, but not responsive to the needs of the community that a child lives in. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing to teach me, for example, about Mar Marcus Garvey and, and how he built the largest mass movement of African people. A lot of people think that would be Martin Luther King, but it was actually Marcus Garvey with the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Um, over 6 million followers worldwide, had a newspaper print, printed in French, Spanish, and English, uh, 200,000 readership, uh, 1,000 businesses in New York City alone. I'm sorry, uh, employing 1,000 people in New York City alone. And this is during the times of the Great Depression, right? Well, it's, it would be culturally res, uh, relevant to teach me about Marcus Garvey, but to be culturally responsive, you got to teach yeah. me how to do what Garvey did, mm. right? So I want to kind of tease out that difference between relevance and responsiveness, okay? Mm. But then there are some cases where the delivery of instruction may be culturally relevant, but the content is not. I'll never forget, I saw this amazing and dynamic rap that a teacher did with students, teaching them about Greek philosophy. It was amazing, it was dynamic. The kids were spitting this rap, they had the rap, they had the rhythm, they had the rhyme. It was very dynamic, but the teaching was about Greek philosophy. And I wish I could have asked that teacher, did you teach those same students about African philosophy that far predates mm. Greek philosophy, okay? As a matter of fact, the word phi philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia. Uh, philo meaning love, sophia meaning wisdom, okay? Well, that word sophia or sophos meaning wisdom, the Greek word, comes from the ancient Kemetic word or Egyptian word, uh, seba. Seba um, is the oldest word in human history relative to teaching and learning. It has three meanings, teach, door, and star. And with this, along with other uh, research information, tells us that the ancient African philosophy of education is that the teacher opens the door to the universe so that the student may shine like a star. So did you teach them about the ancient African philosophers like Imhotep, like Ptahhotep, like Duaf, and, and many others? And, and there's a literature on this, an abundant literature on this. But most of uh, curricula is developed and designed around the notion of Greco-Roman origins, right? Mm -hmm. So many of the ideas flow from that, even when Greece and Rome are not mentioned. 
So when we talk about culturally relevant and responsive teaching and culturally relevant and responsive curricula, again, the teacher is the curriculum. And all these things that I'm spitting to you, 99% of it I had to teach to myself once I realized I was miseducated. I have to face and confront my own personal miseducation every day, but I confront it by reading, by researching, and then by developing activities uh, for my students and things like that. That's great, that's great. So you were able to see your paradigm and take that, you know, courageous approach to addressing it by educating yourself because we know Dr. Akua, a lot of the curricula does not reflect who we really are. So we have to go out there and educate ourselves. If that is that correct to say that? Absolutely. You know, the, uh, Carter G. Woodson, who's called the father of, of black history, who founded Black History, uh, Negro History Week, which later evolved into Black History Month, he said there are two kinds of education, the kind you're given and the kind you must give yourself. Mm. And I at one time was uh, uh, an underperforming student. When I was in high school, I had a 1.9 GPA, but I underwent a dramatic transformation and a, a, a large measure of that transformation that I went through was this quest for self-knowledge uh, and, and delving into our history and culture. And what we find and what I found in my teaching practice was that that was the critical mediating factor uh, culture is the key, the critical mediating factor in increasing uh, student engagement and student achievement for African-American students and students of color. So I found that my students who had uh, prior to being in my class had had D's and F's in language arts and so forth, by infusing the culture and the history into the curriculum, though I was not a history teacher per se, uh, many of them went from D's and F's to A's and B's, and that became the difference maker. That was that person of that relationship. They were able to connect to the mm -hmm. material in which you were providing. That's phenomenal, brother. Um, and our last conversation for this morning, again, we want to thank you for entering this space. The comments are blowing up. Um, <laughs> you have a huge following, brother. Uh, <laughs> you have a huge following. So I want to say thank you again. Um, I told you my personal story growing up here, um, a couple of us as blacks in high school, in contrast to the other, you know, subgroups of whites. Um, but one of my followers, you know, um, posted, I serve this country. I don't believe in all this rhetoric. It's all lives matter. If you can just touch a little bit on this black lives matter versus all lives matter. So we can all, no matter what color we race, creed we come from, we all can have a perspective. Why do we announce? Why do we say, hey, black lives, black lives matter? Do they matter? Why do we say this and we advocate for black lives matter versus all lives matter? Well, uh, to put it bluntly, you know, tell Ahmaud Arbery that all lives matter. Tell Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rashard Brooks that all lives matter. Or we can go back even further. Tell Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner, who was strangled by New York City police, or Sandra Bland, who who was killed in police custody, or Mike Brown, or Philando Castile, Tamir Rice, who was shot within two seconds of, of Cleveland police rolling up on him, no questions asked, 12 years old, shot and killed. Tell them, you know, that all lives matter. As it's been said before, all lives can't matter until black lives matter. And this nation has clearly demonstrated on numerous occasions that black lives don't matter. So for the person that said that uh, comment to you, one of the things that's oftentimes not understood and recognized is that we've all been miseducated, not just black people. All Americans have been miseducated. And one of the things that we've been miseducated about is the atrocities and the rampant white terrorism that has ruled this land. Notice I didn't say white supremacy because white people are not supreme, okay? I said white terrorism because I believe you need to call a thing a thing and name it what it is. And terrorism is what it is. And so when that knowledge of what has been done is kept from the people, then it's not surprising to hear ignorant statements like that. But all you have to do is, is live or be sensitive to the lived experiences uh, of black people to know um, that it's important uh, that we continue to advocate on behalf of, of our rights. Um, 
And, and I don't know <laughs> too much more to say about that because I'm so deeply entrenched in doing the work. And so much of my work is not about convincing white people. <laughs> it's really about convincing us uh, who we are and those that are willing to listen yeah. uh, who may not be black. I agree with that, brother. I agree with mm -hmm. that. Listen, I am feeling just excited. You know, um, you definitely have poured into not just myself, but I'm sure all the audiences out there. We appreciate you so much, brother. Um, again, everybody that's listening, make sure that you go to drakua.net. Um, he has information services, um, shop there, you know, requests. Uh, for Dr. Akua, as well as the transformational um, teacher team. And if you can highlight those books again, Dr. Akua, um, sure. that would be great. Um, but definitely go to the website, drakua.net, uh, mm -hmm. to access more information regarding everything that we're talking about. So, and if you can just show those books, man, that'd be great, Dr. Yeah, Akua. absolutely. The, the book that's uh, used most uh, in professional development with teachers and leaders is uh, Education for Transformation. The Keys to Releasing the Genius of African-American Students. Uh, another great book uh, that helps to give some nuance and insight into the needs of our students would be Honoring Our Ancestral Obligations, Seven Steps to Black Student Success. Both of these books uh, have questions for thought, reflection, and discussion at the end of each chapter. And then we also provide online professional development resources. So you can go to TTI Classroom dot com that's tti as in teacher transformation institute tti classroom dot com and then there's one more uh that i'd like to share with you um that's been proven to be very effective and that's this book reading revolution uh this is a book of 90 reading selections and they're set up in the standardized testing format with a brief reading selection on one side and then 10 multiple choice questions on the other and um Teachers and students love this book. Students love it because they're learning things that they haven't learned before about uh, black history and culture. But teachers and adults and parents love it because much of the information in there is information that they never learned before. And so it gives the teacher the opportunity to go on the journey to cultural consciousness and cultural competency with their students. Um, but as I mentioned, all these and more resources can be found at drakua.net. That's D-R-A-K-U-A.net. And for other online resources, you can go to tticlassroom.com. Again, tticlassroom.com. And there are a couple of our uh, online courses, uh, and some of them are free, uh, are, are available there as well. So Brother LaRue, I really appreciate your time and your effort and the wonderful work that you're doing. And hey, we got to do this again sometime. Hopefully. Absolutely. I'm humbled. I appreciate you, Dr. Akua. Um, and thank you for pouring into me, also our audience out there. Again, guys, make sure you go to drakua.net to find out further information uh, regarding services, as well as the teacher transformational team. That's drakua.net. Thank you, my brother. Have a wonderful and blessed weekend. All right. You too. Take care. You too, brother. I want to thank you guys in advance for everything, right? The feedback, I'm looking at the comments. I am poured into, I mean, we're talking about white terrorism, terrorism versus white supremacy. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Do me a huge favor. Please make sure that you share this information. I'm going to download it as well um, to YouTube and upload it on my Facebook page at LaRue Fitch. Please make sure you share this information with someone out there. Have a wonderful and productive weekend. Stay blessed. Peace.